Welcome. Thank you for coming. This is the Q&A webinar again on the third Thursday of each month at 3 p.m. This is geared a little bit more to small businesses, but I'm getting a lot of calls from people who maybe have a management position in a large employer and they're starting to realize that there's a lot in the handbook that they thought they understood, but when they go to implement it, maybe they don't understand it as well as they thought. So I'm going to cover it from a variety of angles. If you're in that management position where you are supervising other people, you're in what I call the business sandwich generation. And as a mediator, I really love working with you all because I know you get that need to balance competing interests. What we're going to cover in this particular webinar is the distinctions between employee handbooks and mandatory policies. You not only have those federal, state, and if you're in New York City, New York City policies. If you have a physical location, you need to have them up there, but now it is required for you to also have those available to your employees electronically. There is a distinction, believe it or not, between those mandatory policies and what goes into your handbook. We're going to talk about defining the business's vision, mission, and core values, and not just the things that you say you're about, but how you really recognize those core values. We'll talk a little bit about that, and then we'll talk about aligning business and employee needs so that you can communicate those expectations as clearly as possible. As a, an employment attorney and mediator, I get those kinds of situations frequently where the employer has certain needs that they haven't communicated, the employee has certain needs. Half of the battle is recognizing that it's fine that you have a little bit of a difference. We can usually get them to come together so that you can develop what I call a powerful employment partnership that is sustainable. That's the book that I'm working on, by the way. Currently, the working title is Sustainable Workplaces. We'll be talking about that a lot over the coming year. Because I'm a lawyer, I have to give you this disclaimer. This presentation is only providing you general information about employee handbooks. It is focused on New York state law, but I will touch on some of the federal law. If you need legal advice, of course, please consult an attorney in the state or states where you're operating. What really is an employee handbook? What is considered one? What could be interpreted as one? Is it that formal bound publication, that PDF, or is it all those policies in a folder that you access online? It could be either or both or some combination of them. Ultimately, what it comes down to is when the concept of employment being a partnership toward mutually beneficial goals. Your employee handbook is kind of like a partnership agreement, although it'll usually say this is not a contract. I'm going to invite you to just consider that it might be. <laughs> and there is some case law where certain things can be enforced. If you think about the purpose of it, that's really what you want. You want to be able to say, here's what I'm agreeing to. And here's what I need to, from you in, in, in exchange for what I'm promising you. It's just making the relationship really clear. What's the best way to create that employee handbook? Do you go out on the internet and download one or buy one from one of the many vendors? Do you consult an HR expert? It could be either of those. Or it might not have to be that formal. I would recommend that you have an attorney look over whatever your final product is, especially in today's very litigious employment law environment. It's much better for you to take whatever you put together and have a set of legal eyes on it to make sure that you're recognizing some of the major pitfalls. And that's why I'm doing this whole series to make sure that employers are getting the information that they need. If you're the employee, you may have an, a manager that doesn't necessarily understand everything and is making your life miserable in a job you would like to keep. That's where I, I tend to work, bringing people together around policies, around their employment relationship, so that everybody wins in that relationship. Most people need their jobs, right? You take that job because you probably have to have some income. You're not independently wealthy. You're getting something out of it. Likewise, employers 
just admit it. You need those employees too. If you could do everything on your own, you would. You would avoid that expense. Remember again that this is a partnership toward those mutually beneficial goals. It doesn't mean you're going to see eye to eye on everything. And that's a classic life lesson is this is happening all around, but it doesn't mean you can't come together. One of the reasons I do this work, I will admit, is because I've I know that everybody has either had a job, has a job currently, or knows someone with a job. It gives me a universal language <laughs> that I can use with most people. And yes, it is ultimately because I'm trying to get you to learn these skills so you can use them at work as well as at home. It is a way to maybe make a small contribution to a better world. Key components of an employee handbook. It's really critical to think about how you want to introduce yourself if you're the employer. This is where you get to say, this is what we value. Here's where we came from. Here's what we think is most important. And here are our key policies for carrying that out. We have a big vision. You just heard mine. We want more peace in the world. We want people to be able to navigate the world even if they don't agree on everything. We still live in the world together. We need to find a way to navigate that and come out where ideally everybody gets what they need because we all want different things. In the context of employment, if you're thinking about your history, it may also give you some idea on what your values are. A lot from people value integrity. Well, what does that really mean for you in the day-to-day? -day? Line up with that because sometimes what you're saying your values are, your actions are not in alignment with that. How many companies do we hear say they value their employees or the customer is the most important person on the planet to us? But then when you call their customer service line or you're an employee that goes to human resources if your complaints or your concerns fall on deaf ears, is that really living up to the value of you're the most important? If somebody were observing you or observing your company, what do you think they would see as your values? You could look at it from the United States right now. We say in our constitution, here's what we value. But we also know the country has a long history of may not honoring what most people would think is all men are created equal. This is where you have an opportunity to really lay a wonderful foundation for that ongoing sustainable workplace. The other things you want to have in there are policies about safety. And we're talking about not just physical safety, but emotional safety and professional safety. And what do I do if I see some sort of violation? Employment details. This is where it really gets into the expectations and being able to communicate effectively what they need to know about their job classification, how that job classification then will determine what benefits they get, what compensation they get. There is in New York paid family leave. How does that work? It's also to give them an ability to look up the answers that they need that when maybe you are too busy, give them a resource that they can call on so that they aren't always having to depend on you. There's a lot that your employee can't handbook can do. So I do see that we have some questions. One of the questions is, are employee handbooks considered legally binding contracts if benefits are applied universally? Could there be discriminatory benefit plans? The way that an employment attorney would look at this is I would want to see the two different benefit plans and hear if there's a, a reasonable business excuse for why they're so different. There is sometimes disparate impact. If, for example, you have only a certain type of demographic in your executive team, then it might start to look a little like discrimination, but there's a lot more that goes into it than just the benefit plan itself. 
you should get a legal consultation. We live in a, a world and we operate in a country and often in states where you can sue over almost anything. We want to try and minimize the opportunity for you to end up in court. And if you do, we want to make sure that you have enough to defend yourself. It's a lot more complicated than I could give you on a webinar. It wouldn't necessarily just be the benefit plan. It would also be your overall workplace culture, which I think goes into the next question about how the employee handbook can shape a company culture and provide value to employees. Yes, I have found that reviewing and enhancing the employee handbook can be very beneficial. What I have found is that it opens up different conversations. For example, I have been working with a client for a while now where it's changed the way she addresses her employees and how she sees them. It starts there. I went back with her and, and said, let's talk about what you really value in your business and then what kinds of employees you need to align with those goals you're setting based on your values. In other words, the old way of thinking about hiring was, I need a warm body that can do some things. We're starting to look deeper. A lot of the workers coming in to the workforce at this point are demanding this kind of analysis. They want things that we've always wanted, but they're able to articulate it and demand it. I have seen that going through this process with employers and then helping them look for the right, not necessarily culture fit per se, because that can be pretext for dis discrimination, but really look for, can this person perform the essential functions of the job that I have available? How will I know if they're performing well? That's where we start to get into things like KPIs, the key performance indicators, something that's objective. I wrote an article years ago that um, I think really lays this out fairly well. You can have an empowering relationship and a real partnership with employees from the job interview all the way through termination. I've done it both with my clients and I've done it with my employees. You can actually do this with the employee handbook. I'm not at all surprised to get this question from someone who works in DEI, but what sorts of diversity, equity, and inclusion values are allowed or not allowed? I think what we want to be careful with is any kind of language that says a certain group of people, for example, is terrible. That's what a lot of the objections have come down to. So when I talk about having objective criteria for evaluating people in your workplace, it's similar in your policies here regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. Is our policies objective? And if they are, what kind of criteria are we using? Are we using objective data? Are we looking at someone by their ability, or are we looking at where they went to school? Root out that implicit bias, those hidden biases that make us choose things that maybe we wouldn't have if we're relying just on the objective criteria. It's a difference in do they have a degree and does it really matter where they got it from? Like in law, as long as they pass the bar exam in the state where they're going to practice, does it really matter where they went to school? To increase diversity, you'll see a movement toward taking names off, taking the years of graduation off. It's for you in, in the interview process to listen for, do they really have an understanding of the subject matter? We're neutralizing everything as much as possible. We know how to include people. If we're not including them, there's a good chance that there's some sort of discrimination or at least grounds to claim discrimination. If you've hired somebody, make sure that you're onboarding them in a way that they have the opportunity to succeed. Otherwise, you're not including them. And if they are in a protected class and you're treating them differently, then you're probably going to end up with a discrimination claim. On the equity piece, the way the laws are written, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act is 
basically you can't make determinations based on race, gender, ethnicity, et cetera, right? It doesn't say that you can do it for some who have been historically oppressed and marginalized. That's where the cases have been taken all the way up to the Supreme Court. When we're trying to correct historical wrongs that occurred outside of our business, and, and I think you all heard me say this before, it's that piece that starts to invite lawsuits. For example, if you are trying to hire more people from marginalized communities, in particular ones that you feel like have really been shortchanged in, in this country over the history of the past 400 years, and you put in place an initiative to increase that particular demographic, it's going to get very sticky because now you're making a decision based on race. When you're dealing with your policies, I would stick to the ones that are legally mandated. And then you can look at having initiatives, increasing opportunities for people, correcting inequities that are occurring in your workplace after you've done an assessment and collected the data with someone such as Spectra Diversity. <laughs> That's somebody that I've done a webinar earlier in the year with. Spectra helps you collect the data, helps you analyze the data so that you can identify the inequity currently in your workplace, not trying to correct the ones that occurred historically because you can't. It's beyond the scope of what you have the, the ability to do if you're trying to do that, good on you for trying to make a difference in the world, but start with your own place, the place that you have control. It's just like charity starts at home. Fixing your own home is much more important than going out and telling everybody else how to fix theirs. We have another question about how to resign or give your two weeks notice. Understand that in most situations, it's employment at will, unless you're under an employment contract. The two weeks notice is usually a courtesy. It's not required, but in the spirit of employment as partnership, offer that courtesy, give notice and offer to do what you need to, to make sure that it's easy for you to hand off your work to your replacement. It's in that spirit of, I've got something else that seems to align better with my goals going forward. I wish you well. I thank you for the opportunity, even if you're leaving because you hate it there. <laughs> Don't burn the bridge. You might want to find a way to share with them why you're leaving and what things you hope that they might fix, but be cautious about how much you share there and how you share it. You want to be focused on the future and not necessarily the past, which can't be changed, lay it out for them as this is an opportunity for both of us to have something better. Not, I hate you, you were terrible to me, I hope you blow up or whatever. We're all so interconnected and you just don't want to invite more problems as you're trying to lay out your future in a more positive way. Going back to the question about the the resignation letter. I can see that there are some industries where the resignation letter is done day of. Um, would somebody affect maybe your licensure? Remember that retaliation is illegal. If they disparage you, that's also a separate cause of action. The truth obviously is a defense <laughs> to a disparagement claim, but those are all things that we would parse out. That's why people would go to an attorney in that situation. I'm not seeing any more questions. Thank you for attending. I do appreciate you being here. And I think we all appreciate the opportunity to come together. Um, if, if you would prefer a more interactive format in the future, feel free to let me know. I do things this way because I am mindful that, for example, someone who is possibly wanting to leave the employer, you might not want everybody to know right now. I hope I answered all your questions. If not, most of you should know how to reach out to me. You found this on LinkedIn, so you could always just DM me and then we'll set up a call. Just a reminder, if you are communicating me, with me on social media through a direct message, just be very 
mindful of any confidential information you might share in that communication. Take that offline. I'll be doing the next webinar in December. It's the holidays, but the W-2s and the 1099s still need to go out. I am doing a lot of work with employers right now who have misclassified workers throughout the year, and it's going to be much better to adjust them before those forms go out with errors on them. Maybe you owe some payroll taxes or you're an employee that you're getting a 1099 and you were expecting a W-2. What does that mean for you as far as taxes? I'll be covering a lot of that in the next webinar. In the meantime, keep listening with your third ear. And if you need anything, reach out.